What's up gamers, Dreamcast Guy here reviewing today Final Fantasy Dissidia NT. Any series that goes on long enough is bound to get some spin-offs, but this franchise has always been famous for making side games that are downright weird, and this one is easily one of the strangest yet. At its core, this project clearly wants to be thought of as a fighting game, but without any of the typical mechanics you associate with that genre. There aren't really combos, and there's not really a system of trying to counterattack people. Instead, it's more about just having big spells and cool characters, and in that aspect, it's extremely good at its job. However, this isn't really a great game as a whole, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's back up and explain how the heck that all these different heroes are even coming together. Does Cydia take takes place in an alternate reality between dimensions, where each of the different Final Fantasy universes exist. In this land, new gods have started popping up, people who worship destruction and life, and they've used their powerful abilities to try and pull all these different characters that we know and love together. When it really comes down to it, that is what this game does best, is it just brings together a bunch of different, really weird, different kinds of heroes and villains and makes them all come together in a way that actually fits surprisingly well. The reason this works is because of the interesting gameplay. So instead of having a typical stat like attack and defense, Dissidia runs on a bravery system. So as you see at the bottom of the screen, there are two different meters. A meter that's going up with a giant number, which is my attack, and a second bar, which signifies my health. When my health runs out, obviously I'm dead. But the other number is the more important one in my opinion, because that is all about how hard I can hit. In order to build up your bravery, you need to go up and strike your opponent with bravery attacks. These actually drain their stamina, making it where you're stealing all of their bravery. Essentially what you're doing is sapping their strength, weakening them to strengthen yourself. Do that enough and you can literally one-shot people, but there is a catch. So each time you actually hit someone, you expend all of your bravery attack points. Basically meaning that you get to build up and build up and build up, but when you hit, it needs to be a freight train to absolutely decimate your opponent or else they can knock you down easily. This style of combat creates a really fun tug-of-war mechanic to every single fight because it makes it where as you're constantly trying to pull energy back and forth, eventually one person is going to be incredibly powerful. You'll usually end up with one guy who's managed to tap everybody once or twice, gets super strong, and is ready to one-shot one enemy. And I like that because it makes it where there's this constant threat where you need to be very aware of the battles because this isn't one-on-one -on -one fights. This is a 3v3 team system, which means that you need to be aware, switching targets and keeping an eye on each enemy's bravery points because if they get too strong, then they're going to drop somebody and you have to hope it isn't you. If you do unfortunately get absolutely destroyed, you can hop right back up because what they've introduced in this sequel is something that's really interesting in my opinion, which is a team life system. So up in the top left, there is a three-point system, which makes it where each time you die, you can come back to life, but up to a total of three times per team. Now, the reason I'm so in love with this is because it makes it where a good player can do a lot, but a bad player will actually punish the entire team. It makes it where if you see somebody who's particularly weak and not very good, targeting them can actually win you a match fast. It makes it where you sort of... Uh, end up playing the game like wolves, looking for the people who are the most susceptible to your attacks and taking them out as quick as possible, dropping the foes that are the easiest to kill in order to weaken the entire team. In order to take out targets efficiently though, you're going to need to worry about more than just how strong they are, you need to keep an eye on what class they are. So you have to think about it, each of these characters may be the strongest person in their universe, but they're also people who have specific training. Some of these are spellcasters, or great swordsmen, or people who actually manage to have multiple skills like Cecil, who's both a paladin and a dark knight. Because of this, each character fights 100% differently, like 
For example, let's focus on Cloud for a second. Obviously, this guy has a huge, giant sword that's made for bashing in faces. And he actually has a very slow attack pattern. When he's in your face, he could really mess you up. However, if I'm playing like somebody as the Onion Knight, I could really sit back, send out a couple spells, and keep him slowed down. There's a really subtle but sharp balance to how each of these characters manage to interact in the field, making it where if you actually work together with your teams and have a good balance and mix of skills, you can do a lot of damage. However, I do think that there is a little bit of a detriment to the fact that I think some people are way, way weaker. It seems like they made the characters that would be the most popular, like Sifroth, incredibly strong and incredibly easy to use, where more obscure characters like Cloud of Darkness are overly intricate. These people can still be strong, but uh, I feel like 99% of players, especially online, are going to be picking the characters that are easy to use because everybody wants to be strong. Everybody wants to win matches, and sometimes that comes down to being the person with the biggest, heaviest weapon. There is an extra layer to this combat that I think only the more skilled players are ever going to experiment with, and that's the EX attack system. Consider these as special spells that you take into a battle. Now, these are important because they make it where you can do stuff like blind an opponent, which makes their screen blurry, or slow, which could make it where all their attacks are dramatically slowed down, of course. Now, the reason I say that this is so important is because if you're somebody who you know has a weakness against physical attacks, it can be smart to put in extra spells that weaken the enemies that are the strongest against you. Now, I love the idea that better players are going to experiment with this and set themselves up for easy victory, especially if they're smart enough to use summons wisely. Perhaps the thing that shifts the flow of battle the most is giant summons. These crystals appear periodically throughout a fight, and if you run over and start smashing them, you'll get the ability to cast one magic spell, a giant summon, which actually affects the entire battlefield. So, as you can see, a god shows up, does a really cool big attack to start with, and then stays there next to you for the next 20 seconds. If you pull in somebody like Odin or even free to actually walk around in the battlefield next to you punching people and throwing fire, it is going to turn the tide of combat quickly. And I like this because it makes it where there's a constant shift. It creates a new sort of tactic because there are the players who will fight you directly, but then there are some that also kind of dash around the boundaries of the field, wait for an EX crystal to appear, smash it, and then drop a giant summon. Both of these are legitimate strategies, but I'm much more of an in-your-face attacker. Now, we've talked a lot about combat, but let's kind of get into the story mode because this, in my opinion, is the weirdest and worst part of the game itself. In order to unlock the story mode, which I have to use that word, you actually buy cutscenes. Yes, I'm being serious. Basically, what happens is, as you play through the arcade mode over and over again, you unlock memory shards, and these make it where you go into the story mode and buy the next chapter. Now, each chapter is purchased singularly, which means to get to even the first fight in the story mode, you're going to have to do at least 20 good rounds of single player, just random arcade mode, in order to get enough points to actually go in and fight somebody in the plot. It's so weird that it seems disconnected. It seems like somebody was like, okay, we want people to just keep doing random battles, but how do we motivate them to keep coming back to the story? And the only thing they could come up with is buying cutscenes. It's such a dumb system, and honestly, if the writing itself was a little bit better, I might be invested, but I hate that I watch a 30 second cutscene do 20 minutes of random battles, and then go back and watch another 30 second cutscene. Now, I will say that as you get deeper into the story mode, there are some really, really awesome scenes, like actually battling summons and group combat. Those moments are great, but it still feels like that there is a, a severe lack of 
of ideas in Dizidaya. It seems like they didn't want to try and make a single plot line that was easy to follow, so instead they made it where you keep having to stop, go and do some random battles, and then come back. It definitely shows that this game only exists for super fans in my opinion. It's made for people like me, who already love these characters, knows the games they're from, and understands what they're like in order to see them all interact. I got some real enjoyment from watching people like Noctis interact with these other heroes, but at the same time, it's really annoying that there's just these little bite-sized chunks, constantly making it where I get a little slice of story and then go right back to the same arcade mode I've been playing for 10 hours makes it seem like such a weird bait and switch. I wish I got just a story mode that I could play start to finish, just an arcade mode that I could play start to finish, and then go online. There are just too many pieces of ideas in this game. So many concepts that are set out there unfinished. The combat is cool to watch, but not super deep. These characters are really gorgeous looking, but at the same time, not really that complex. The battlefields are super cool, and watching them evolve is fantastic. But at the same time, they're basically just big flat boxes. None of this stuff is specifically awful, it's just not great. Dissidia is something that I think ultra fans like myself are going to get a real kick out of, but not really remember in even a month's time. Okay, so we've heard some good and some bad, but let's over the ratings board and put a big number on it. I am giving Final Fantasy Dissidia in T a 7 out of 10. If you were looking at this game because you played the previous ones on PSP, I'd say wait for it to go on sale. If this were probably about 20 or 30 bucks, it's a really interesting experience. However, I'm not sure it's actually worth picking up at full price. Thanks so much for watching gamers, this has been Dreamcast Guy with another review. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, share it with your friends, and subscribe if you haven't already. But do me the biggest favor of all and keep dreaming. Alright, I'm going to go back and smash in just a few more faces of Sifroth because I am truly the one-winged angel. Oh, hey! I was just playing a little bit of Grand Theft Auto on my Darth Vader PSP. Are you curious what I'm going to come out with next? Well, if you click this button, you'll be subscribed to be the first to know. Also, if you click over here and here, you can see my latest review and my latest top 10. I promise, it was super good. Or it was really bad and I'm sure you can just make fun of me in the comments. Either way, it'll be a lot of fun. Thanks so much for watching.